evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I am happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. Thank you for joining us for the latest in our virtual spirituality series. We are so happy to have Father Jerry Blazczyk, our Vice President for Mission and Identity, and Father Michael Judy from the class of 1970, who is our Director of Restorative Mentoring. We do ask that you please keep your microphones muted during the presentation just to avoid distracting our speakers and our other guests. And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry to kick off the conversation. Thank you, Jessica. Let me just, I'm not, I'm not gonna leave, I'm gonna continue. All right, uh, Jessica introduced this conversation as part of a series on spirituality. Jesuit spirituality is not ethereal, it's not abstract, it's flesh and blood. The best way to introduce you to a, a further reflection or a deepening of your already uh, great familiarity with Jesuit spirituality is by looking at people who live it. And so I when say. Janet Canapa and I and Jessica were discussing who should be on this series who should be able to talk to you about their lives and therefore introduce you to what Jesuit spirituality looks like as it's lived, how could we not invite Father Michael Duty? For many of you who are part of tonight's uh, gathering, uh, to talk <laughs> about Fairfield uh, is to talk about Michael Duty, or to talk about Michael Duty is to talk about Fairfield. To say that Michael is a substantial presence on our campus is no exaggeration. And it is not only because of his size, it is because of the, the strength of his presence, because of, of his affability, because of his availability. If it weren't for COVID, Michael would be, I'm sure he'd have about six different student events that he would have lined up to be attending this evening. So. Uh, I welcome all of you, and uh, I welcome my dear friend and my Jesuit confrere, Michael Duty, to share with you different aspects of his long Jesuit life, and therein help you understand really from his example what it means to follow God in the path of Ignatius Loyola. There are many spiritual paths. There are many different paths. But the Jesuit path is one that has its own particularities and its own specific qualities. And I think as you listen to Father Michael Duty, I challenge you to ask yourself that question. What is there about this man's approach, about his ministry, about his story that helps me understand better this charism, this special spirituality of the Jesuits that I hope those of you who are alumni and alumni experience during your time at Fairfield. Now, I don't think many of you, there actually there may be some, uh, I'm not sure how many of you uh, have as long an experience of Fairfield, except maybe Jim Fitz if he's watching. Michael, I believe it was back in September of 1965 that you made your way onto this campus. I know that you had turned Georgetown down and that you had decided to come to Fairfield. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got here and what you found when you got here? You know, I, uh, I had a cousin, second cousin and so forth, uh, when I was a boy in Canada, related to my mother who was a Jesuit. And uh, we saw him once a year at the family picnic in Lake Ontario in Port Hope. And uh, he inspired me, and so did my parish priest inspire me. So, wait, Michael, I'm sorry. Are you a Canadian or an American? I moved to Canada when I was five. My mother okay. was from Canada, so <clears throat> moved back to the states when I was 15. So, and uh, my parish priest also inspired me in Canada. So, when I came to the states, uh, his office went to St. Dominic's High School in Oakland Bay for two years after being in boarding school in Canada for two years. Um, I knew applying to schools that I wanted to go to a Jesuit school, you know, and my, my grandmother lived in the Bronx and she wanted me to go to Fordham. I didn't want to live in the Bronx with my grandmother. Imagine that. <laughs> so uh, as much as I loved her. Uh, and uh, I looked at BC, but it was too far from home. And uh, I really wanted to go to Georgetown. Uh, but for some reason I declined Georgetown's invitation. 
and uh, Fairfield was it. And uh, I mean, it was such a gorgeous campus when I came here, but when I visited, I mean, it was 205 acres at the time and uh, we didn't have the convent yet. And uh, it, was, it was just stellar. It was mostly woods. It was, of course, it was only 2,200 students and not, not very many buildings. So um, Fairfield became my choice. It was 72 miles uh, or 72 minutes from Oyster Bay. I could get back and forth very quickly to bring my laundry. So, which I did on some occasions. But um, you know what, what really hit me at, uh, at Fairfield as a, as a kid, 18 year old kid was uh, the number of Jesuits. There were about 85 Jesuits here at the time. Uh, they lived in uh, mm. the top floor of Berkman's. They lived in the top floor of McAuliffe. They lived in the top floor, half of the top floor of uh, Gonzaga. There was a Jesuit in every corridor and every residence hall. And they lived in, in Bellman Hall. They were they were like cockroaches. I mean, not really, but I mean, there were so many of them. No, come on, a better <laughs> metaphor, please. <laughs> they, they were mm. everywhere. They were everywhere. Mm. And, uh, and they... They were happy, you know, they looked happy. I knew them, I came to know them as happy. My father was a happy man, but I think, but my father was a driven, driven businessman in New York. We never saw him, he traveled too much and uh, he didn't seem happy. So I, in comparison, the Jesuits seemed remarkably happy, you know, and uh, and I was a religious kid, Irish Catholic family, went to mass every Sunday and yada, yada. It was just after Vatican II when I came to Fairfield. <clears throat> and uh, it, uh, it was really exploding here on campus with the Jesuits. And the Jesuits had been so much part of it in, in many ways. Many Jesuits were famous for their part in Vatican II. So uh, it, uh, Fairfield was a, a, a mecca for anybody interested in uh, the Vatican II. The liturgy was changing. Uh, we had hootenanny masses. I don't know if anybody remembers those terms. Well, the, the guitars came in and uh, dialogue homilies. And uh, I was... I became a really, really, really religious kid, and uh, and I love the Jesuits. I mean, you could always find a Jesuit to talk to about anything that was on your mind, you know. And uh, Bill McGinnis, who was the president at the time, uh, for some reason became fond of me, and uh, and I of him. Uh, I used to drive him to the airport in his uh, his car with license number FU seven seven seven. We don't have that car anymore, or that license um, for some reason. Uh, but uh, Ray Bertrand, who was my quarter prefect as a freshman, uh, who later became my novice master. Um, Willie Holman, who <laughs> Loyola won, walked up and down the hallway with his small baseball bat and threatened to hit you, but never did. Uh, and there, there was such a variety of men in the Jesuits. And you know, it's funny at the time, I mean, it wasn't unusual for me. I'd gone to boys boarding school, but it was all men when I came here. Uh, and matter of fact, in 1966, uh, the student body voted against going co-ed. I remember that very clearly. Nobody already went here, so that uh, you couldn't have women in your rooms until I think my junior year when you could have parietal hours. You, yeah. have, you could keep your door open uh, eight inches with the telephone book or something, you know. Uh, but it was a big deal, so women could finally go into the guys' rooms, the seniors, I think, only that year. But uh, so parietal hours, it was, uh, so we had to go to mass twice a week. Uh, when I was a freshman or a sophomore, you had to turn in your mass card uh, to prove that you've been to mass. Otherwise you were threatened with, with losing your housing, which they wouldn't have done, I don't think really. Uh, but uh, but it, was a, it was a real Catholic campus and you know, we all went to mass and it was religious. I remember the campus center opened the, uh, <clears throat> I think the beginning of my sophomore year, maybe the middle of my freshman year. And uh, we used to have mass at midnight on Saturdays in the campus center. And about 30 Jesuits would show up to come celebrate mass and be packed, be packed in there with students. Uh, it, uh, it was just a wonderful experience. We had guitar music. It was, so, so I, I loved it and I, and I loved the Jesuits. And you know, the Jesuits were all, some of them were kind of quirky, <laughs> you know, but, but you sort of dealt with that, you know, it, uh, most of them were just there to help you. They, they really, really wanted to give themselves to, to God 
by giving themselves to students. It, uh, that was really true of the Jesuits I knew here. Michael, and, when did you start thinking yourself that you might want to be a Jesuit? <clears throat> in my freshman your father, year. Your father was a businessman. He had his own business. He must have had his heart set on your continuing his business, right? That well, you would go told, on and study business and take over his work? He told me what I was going to do with my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was a different age. So, right? So, uh, and <clears throat> we butted heads. And uh, But I knew, I knew from the time I was a sophomore that I wanted to go down this road, you know? Um, my time spent with Bill McGinnis and with Ray Bertrand and with a scholastic named Tony Hecker. They were such important times for me. They never tried to bring me in. George Gallarelli. Ah, uh, George. What a prince of a man. When I was a freshman and the dining room was in the basement of Loyola Hall. And after dinner, we'd all put our chairs up on the tables and George and brother McElroy would go downstairs after dinner at some point and mop that floor in the cafeteria. Imagine. I mean, it's just, and they, every Jesuit, every priest in the house on the weekends would be going out to a parish in order to bring money into the university. You know, these, and these men really threw themselves into it. And I, you know, they had joy in their work I and mean, they really loved what they were doing. They, I said, you know what, I want to do this. this, this they're happy, they're way happier than my father. And uh, I, mean, I told my parents, and I figured I'd wait till I graduated. I told my parents when I was a junior that this is what I was going to do. <clears throat> uh, my father rather lost his temper because uh, he was believe, he believed I was taking business courses. There was no business school, but I was taking philosophy courses. I told him, "Well, they're required, Dad. They're required. They're required." Finally, I I just paid you to and then I uh, I ended up my junior year because you know, I, I had some really close friends for Tony Giuliano. Uh, he uh, he was my roommate junior year. I haven't seen him in years. I wish I'd kept in touch with him. But he uh, he what was, was his name again, Michael Anthony Giuliano. He had in the case you're out there, Anthony. <laughs> he had the patience of Job because you know I was working this thing through. And do I want to do it? Should I do it? Will I annoy my father? Do I dare get threaten this relationship with my father? Um, I just so it'd be two o'clock in the morning. I said, Tony, what do you think, Tony? What about uh say say, Michael, shut up. I need to get some sleep. And uh, but I, I had a couple of other friends, Tom Fix, another one who had to listen to me constantly. Michael Coonahan's another one who listened to me constantly. Uh, but it was uh, so finally I just said, screw it, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter after junior year and uh, and I had a summer plan to be away for the summer anyway. I was working on, on cruise ships as Ballet to the captain, so my parents didn't have access to me, and I, I, I finished out my summer and uh, and I entered, you know. But I had uh, I had these great priests. I made a retreat with uh, Bill McGinnis, uh, another weekend retreat with Ray Bertrand. Um, I had uh, I knew this was right for me. Michael, knew, were there other people, other graduates, or other Fairfield students around the time who came into the society around the same time? Well, there were five of us entered my year. Wow. Uh, I'm the only one who survived. No, no, there's another. Calvin, uh, Calvin Goodwin entered my year. Uh, he uh, he left the Jesuits but joined a uh, very conservative order of priests. I can't remember which group they are, but he has he's suffered bad health for the last five or six years. Poor Calvin, and uh, but Bob Arnone, Gary Walensic, uh Dan Madigan. I think he's a priest in Maine now. So there were five of us, you know. Wow, wow. But Michael, was, Jesuit formation is notoriously long. Um, so uh, as, you, as you cast an eye over that long stretch of time, about 12, 13 years. Um, 10 for me. 10 for you. Okay, you were a fast learner. Uh, yeah. As you look over those 10 years, what would you identify as the high points of your experience as being formed as a Jesuit? You know, my divisiate uh, was, was in Shadowbrook, Michael. Shadowbrook, you know, and up in the up in the country in Lenox, Massachusetts. You know, there were fifty of us as novices. You know, from around New England, and uh, we had a great novice master, a great socialist, and uh, I, I enjoyed the life. You know, I learned how to pray. Um, I learned how to 
look at my life in front of God and uh, understand my it was gratitude my creation. I understood, came to understand my weaknesses. But that God, the thing that I really most learned of all, and I try to teach students, is that God just takes us wherever we are. God just, wherever we are, that's where God takes us. And that's how I start. That's how I work with students. Wherever they are, that's where I take them. They're, God loves them exactly where they are. And I just, that converted me in a lot of ways as a novice. You know, there was a great growth in me as a novice in that kind of <laughs> There was a lot of lack of acceptance of myself given my the stress of my, my family. So, uh, so after the I uh, since I had in philosophy, I uh, I went down to Jamaica West Indies to teach. You went to Jamaica. I went to Jamaica St. George's College. Did I, you volunteer, Michael, or were you volunteered? I did volunteer. Yeah, I mean that's uh, now I had never taught anything in my life. I had never taken a course in education. I. Uh, I, the sort of deal I was making with them was, oh, I'll teach first freshman religion, which would be down there, would be 11-year-olds and so forth and so on, and freshman English. Fine, fine, fine. So I got down there, and uh, I kept asking for the books. So hey, we'll get them. We got them. Finally, the, uh, a week before school started, I said, well, you're not teaching uh, younger kids. You're going to teach the seniors because this guy from England didn't arrive, so they gave me the books for seniors. But I was... I didn't know which way to turn. But, you know, you just do what you have to do. You jump in with both feet. And uh, I taught the students pretty soon that uh, I wasn't to be messed with. I was a nice guy, but they they tried to play it. I'll never forget, Jerry, <laughs> the uh, senior class. They knew I was fresh from the States. And, uh, they, you know, the kids know how to deal with new teachers in high school. So I was teaching this class in English. And... Uh, all of a sudden it was going like this. Huh, oh, huh, hmm. Different noises come from around the room. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, yeah, you, know, you can't, you, you can't win that situation when you're teaching high school kids. You just can't. And I knew it. So I said, all right, guys, at the end of class, I said, close the doors. The doors had louvers, as said the windows, so air could come through. And I uh, said, so when the bell rings, just stay where you are. I said, because I'm told to teach you for 55 minutes and you have prevented that from happening. So once the bell rings, we will have our 55 minutes of class. And every time you interrupt me, I'll add five minutes. Well, I have soccer. I have this, I thought, oh, well, you sat on the bench before with soccer. You know, you'll, uh, actually they called it football. So they sat and, uh, and I taught for my 55 minutes. And I said, so this is going to be my way, just so you know. I said, if it's second period and, and not the last period, you'll come back after school and, and we'll get our work in because that's what I'm expected to do. That's what I'm supposed to give to you. I never had another problem with discipline my, my whole time at St. George's. And I love it. I love teaching. I loved high school kids. They were wonderful. What did you love yeah. about them, Michael? Uh, apart from learning how to eat curry and jerk chicken and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, oxtail, uh, what, what did you carry away that was really valuable for you as you continued in your, your Jesuit formation then, especially as you uh, moved toward priesthood? Well, you know, I was down there with 13 scholastics, you know. I mean, they scholastics were, are Jesuit seminarians in training. Right, we, some of us teaching. And, uh, right. Young, we have a we have a Jesuit scholastic teaching at prep right now, Brendan Coffey, whom you I uh, hope you'll meet if you come back to the series. But the um, there were two guys up at Campion. There were two of us at George's. Some were at the University of West Indies. But over the period of two years, uh, ten of them uh, left uh, the Society of Jesus. And after I came back to the states, the other the other two left. So. Um, you learn how to deal with disappointment. You, you learn how to pray and stay praying and, and put yourself in God's hands, you know, and, and to find rewards in the work you're doing, you know. And I mean, I, I really believed at the time, I still believe that if God hadn't wanted me to be there, I wouldn't be there. And I took my vows very seriously. I'm a stubborn Irishman, in case you hadn't picked up on that over the years, Jerry. Uh, so um, I just said, this is the right thing for me to do. Well, uh, you know, I had a great impact on these students. I ran the yearbook for two years, 
And uh, I was so impressed by how these kids gave themselves to this kind of work. But it's part of how they give themselves is how you give them yourself to them, you know? And it's, it's really true. And uh, I mean, it's, you go to mass every day and if you can. And uh, my father by this time had sort of, uh, had a mad culpa and uh, he sent money to me from time to time to take a busload of students from Kingston. My kids lived in the ghettos of Kingston, basically. Um, and they had never seen a beach. So he was- wow, they lived in Jamaica and they had never seen the beach. Never seen a beach, never seen, never stepped in salt water. So, uh, so I would, my father sent money, I'd rent a bus from time to time. Once a month I'd rent a bus. And Jack Allen, the other Scholastic and I, and maybe somebody else would take these buses over Mount Diablo to Ocho Rios, to uh, Duns River Falls, <laughs> where all these all these white tourists would be, <laughs> this black bus full of black kids from Kingston would get out and be there at the beach. We had a, we had wonderful times, but uh, at least I was able to show them their own country to some extent, you know. And I think it gave my father an opportunity too to be his breast. Uh, so it was, you know, that's the sort of thing he did, and uh, and he just took. Pleasure in it. But you know, the, the rector there, Larry Burke, was became Archbishop of Kingston later, was such an understanding man. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him because it was a, a he was a Jamaican, native Jamaican, right? Jamaican, Larry. Yeah. It was a struggle. It was a struggle, you know. And there uh, there were only two scholastics in St. George's. Well, I'll tell you a funny story on this. I'll be at the end of St. George's. Because I don't run down my time. Um, so I was a scholastic when then and they, they used to say in the Society of Jesus, the, the end of a scholastic is to be kicked. So scholastics, there used to be so many that uh, they didn't have many privileges or rights uh, and you could be walked over by the, the older fathers. Who well, thought I, it was their job to humiliate you? Right, right. Well, I didn't take too, too well to that. Mm. So I remember one weekend, we couldn't get off campus. It was so... You, it's so difficult to leave campus because it was a dangerous part of the city. Uh, I had signed up a car for a Friday night with uh, Scholastic that I was living with and two Scholastics at Campion to go to a movie when we hadn't left campus in ages. So I went to get the car and somebody else had crossed my name off and put his name in. And I went, I said, where did Father Heffernan go? Where did Father he took my car? I said, oh, he went to play Mahjong with the Changs. I remember it like it was yesterday. So I said, Mahjong with the Changs. I, I was so annoyed. So I said to the guys, I said, well, we can't go to the movies. I said, who wants to go to Boston Beach tomorrow? Boston Beach is in Port Antonio, about uh, 50 miles away, great beach. I said, yeah. I said, well, I said, well, we'll get the van. Well, no, Father Heffernan, <laughs> Heenahan has the uh, the van signed up tomorrow for golf with his buddies from Campion. I said, you know, Heffernan. I said, well, you know, you can't have it both ways. So he took off. I said, if we're ready at 6.30 in the morning, I have the van, we're going. So I crossed his name off, <laughs> put my name in, and uh, we had our food all packed up. And off we went in the van to, <laughs> to Boston Beach. And uh, apparently Heffernan was quite annoyed when he found his van wasn't there. They missed their golf date. And we came back around 5.30 and the rector was out in the parking lot, <laughs> Larry Burke. And he says, duty. He says, what did you do? I said, what do you mean what I did? I said, I went to the beach. He said, Father Heffernan is so mad at you because he was supposed to go golfing. I said, listen, Larry. And I was supposed to go to the movies last night with a couple of guys. And we signed a car up to go to the movies and Heffernan took the car to go play Mahjong. So he signed up to play golf today and I took the van to go to the beach. I said, you know, turn about's fair play. <laughs> oh God, he says, you know, you're brazen. He says, good for you, good for you. He says, well, don't go in the house just yet. Let me go straighten this out with Heffernan. <laughs> so he, he calmed the waters before I, uh, <laughs> before I ran into him. Never happened to me again. Michael, when you came back to the States then, did you, 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 uh, I, I know this because I ended up living in, in the same community with Michael. You came up to Weston College, correct? I did. In Cambridge, Mass. Well, and I went to... I went and to, weren't you uh, also doing another degree? Did you do a degree at BC at the same time? I did a master's degree at BC in, mm -hmm. uh, in an MBA in finance at BC. Uh, 
and then uh, I finished I finished the degree at uh, at BC, and I went over to Weston where you were in '75. And while I was with you in '75, I taught at Boston College and studied theology at Weston School of Theology while you were studying at Harvard. <laughs> the, the esteemed Harvard PhD. So, you so can see the grief I took. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. But no, but I mean, that's when we became friends. I mean, 1975, it's been a, a, a wonderful friendship all these years. And uh, Jerry actually has, uh, has directed my retreat on several occasions, uh, keeping my head above water from time to time. Did no praise, no blame, Michael. <laughs> so, no, so we had, I mean, that's been three years at Weston studying theology. And what I wanted to do when I finished theology was to uh, either go for the DBA or just to go to BC and teach and then eventually get the doctorate in business administration. Uh, but uh, superiors had other things in mind for me. They, they were sure that I needed a pastoral year because I was too business oriented at the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they sent it's me also a pretty, a pretty normal stage uh, in Jesuit formation that, I, I, you know, we've been in studies for so long that the year after ordination is being plunged into the, uh, the ups and downs and the, and the requirements of, li of being a priest in an, in an ordinary parish. But Michael went to anything but an ordinary parish. He went to Holy Trinity in Georgetown. I loved it. I was supposed to go for one year. I stayed for three, Jerry. So it... Uh, they were, one of the reasons I liked it, one of the reasons they sent me, they were doing a, uh, uh, a renovation, restoration of the church. Uh, and funny enough, it was 1978. It was only going to be a million dollars. I mean, imagine trying to restore a church today for a million bucks. Couldn't do it. Uh, there were a lot of wealthy parishioners, but they weren't very generous at the time. But uh, the money got raised and the church got restored. Beautiful restoration. Not a major, major restoration. We couldn't afford what, what it would have cost, but it was spectacular. And Jim English, the parish priest, had such insight. And uh, But they were there too. Uh, I mean, I learned all the theology I needed to be a priest at Western School of Theology. I learned how to be a priest from Tom Gavigan and Jim English, the, uh, the two parish priests at uh, Holy Trinity in Georgetown. Remarkable men. Wonderful, wonderful men. Jim English... Though he had some issues himself later in life, he had a, a silver tongue. He, uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant preacher, then liturgist, and he loved his people. Tom Gavigan, who had been novice master, Jim's novice master, and the previous pastor, was also a very fine preacher, a good theologian. He actually, he was, uh, he wasn't allowed, for a couple of years there, he wasn't allowed to preach in Holy Trinity, he oh, by, by uh, oh, Boyle, by, Cardinal Boyle. Yep, because he uh, he had said something negative about uh, Humanae Vitae, the birth control document. So even though he couldn't preach, um, the uh, the nuncio <laughs> sent a limousine up once a month to pick up Father Gavigan to bring him down to the nunciature to hear the confessions of everybody in, in the nunciature. So he was good enough to hear the confessions of the people from the nuncios on down, but not good enough to hear the confessions of the people of his parish. <laughs> so just that's just one of these things with the Jesuits, I suppose, you know. Um, Michael, did you ever imagine that you would then go, I know that there was a little detour, but then the bulk of your life before you came back to your alma mater was in St. Louis, right? Right. How um, did you end up in St. Louis? Well, I had done five years of development work at Western School of Theology after Trinity. And it was time for, for my tertianship because I, and it was 10 years already. I was 10 years out already from ordinary. Yeah, you all know the tertianship is the last stage, official stage of Jesuit formation. Uh, it's supposed to be what the Jesuits call, or Ignatius called, the school of the heart. So that after all these years of study and formation, you go back and you make the spiritual exercises again. Uh, very often you're sent to another culture. Very often you are, are invited to do ministries that you haven't done before. So it's a real spiritual renewal before you're invited to pronounce your final vows, which peculiarly with the Jesuits happened some years after your ordination. So, Michael, you went to, you went to Holy Ireland for your tertianship? Is that I, right? went, I went to the Holy Land, Holy Ireland. I did indeed. So 
<laughs> it was, you know, now I had been, Jerry, I had been in this, at Holy, at the Holy Trinity, this very wealthy parish, and then at Western School of Theology's director of development. So I was wearing, in those days, pinstripe suits, dress shirts, I mean, out to fancy dinners, big fundraising dinners, all this sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm sent off to, to Ireland, uh, 40 years old, to uh, do this School of the Heart. And uh, we get there and the, the tertium director decides he wants us to live like novices, you know. Um, and, and, and they're, they're, they're somewhat austere, or they were in those days. So he, uh, we were told that we would turn in all our money that we brought with us uh, and that we would get an allowance that we might need from, uh, from him or the minister. And uh, we were to live austere poverty and uh, said, holy glory. <laughs> this is not going to be the, not, for, not my idea of a good time. So I, I took him at his word. <laughs> I turned in all my money, but I kept my credit card. <laughs> my, you had not mentioned credit, credit cards, so uh, if he wasn't asking for them, you weren't giving them, right? He didn't ask for it. I didn't volunteer it. <laughs> so, so I was obedient, uh, not in the spirit, but in the practice. So, so I had to have some little freedom there, but it was. It was good. I enjoyed the 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 exercises. Again, were wonderful for me. It, uh, it made me look at my life in, in retrospect. Years I've been out of Jesus, and and realize look at some yeah, some areas where I needed a little uh, polishing, uh, a little penance, um, some confession, um, uh, a reorganization of, of my spiritual time. Because uh, when you get busy, 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 sometimes you, the prayer is sometimes the first thing to go. You're, you're, so, uh, so it was a great year for me. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't, um, I certainly wasn't working with wealthy people when I was uh, on my experiments. Uh, my first experiment. <coughs> we That's what the Jesuits call these pastoral assignments, either mm -hmm. during the novitiate or during tertianship. Ignatius believed that what most formed Jesuits were experimenta, experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, so Michael's uh, tertian master, like his novice master, would have tried to um, look for experiences that would both challenge Michael and bring out the best in him. And humbled me a little bit. <laughs> so, so my first experiment or experience was uh, to work in a large community in Inverness, Scotland. So this was, I went there October 31st, the day after my birthday, and uh, stayed there. Do you there. want to explain, Michael, what a large community is? That... Oh, okay, yeah, I will. I'm sorry, I should have done that. Large, uh, by Jean Vanier. Jean Vanier founded this uh, community of people to care for uh, challenged individuals, mostly mentally challenged individuals. Seriously, seriously challenged though. All over the world they are now, large communities. And uh, so there'd be about four, maybe five challenged people in a house and uh, maybe three or four people who were um, challenged in different ways, shall we say. But you also know? charged to be caregivers. Right, so that's where I went and uh, there were, well, you know, so Michael's fast mouth and his fancy, you know, Oyster Bay manners wasn't going to get him anywhere <laughs> with these, uh, you know, extremely mentally challenged and sometimes physically challenged uh, sisters and brothers in the large community. So his tertian instructor was very wise. <laughs> well, I shouldn't tell you the story, but I'm going to. Uh, now, Michael, be careful. This is, you know, this is like God knows who's going to hear this. All right, then I won't tell the story I was going to think of. Uh, but they uh, they left little hints around the house about uh, how much you were cared for or not cared for, shall we say. Uh, like the toilets might not always be clean. I see. You know, they, it's, so there were little, little digs, you know. Because, uh, but I had to learn to deal with these people. And I, I you know, I came to love them. So when the time was well, up. Because they, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that they... Paul, I mean, like your tertiary instructor knew that this was an opportunity for you to move from your heart, yeah. it's, which uh, is ultimately, as I know you, what has really given force and power to your ministries anyway. 
Yeah. Well, let's jump. I'm, 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 I'm conscious of the fact that I don't want us to not get to the, your return to, uh, to Fairfield, but could you say a little bit about St. Louis? So you, after tertianship, you went to St. Louis, to the University of St. Louis. Well, I did two more years of, of fundraising for one of our high schools, and then I've had enough of that. The provincial had promised me before that I wouldn't have to do any more fundraising, but he was going back in his words, so I had a tantrum. How unlike me. So he says, all right, go work at chemist industry if that's what you want to do. So I, a friend of mine was at St. Louis University, a very close friend of mine. He'd been the president of Western School of Theology when I was there. So I went down there in, into campus ministry. I lived for 16 years in a 17-story high-rise dormitory. And uh, I would take the elevator to the top every night and walk every floor down. Wow. Every night, the whole time I was there. And any door that was open, I would in and talk to people. So I, uh, after two years of that. So you overcame your native shyness and reserve and. Uh... <laughs> so I, but I, I love the students, you know, I just did. And, you know, people get annoyed with students. I, I, I seldom get annoyed with students because, you know, they're, they're 18 to 22 and they're, they're basically by and large doing what comes natural to them, you know, they're. They ain't perfect, and neither am I, neither are any of us, you know. And so uh, I became very popular with students. They, I mean, I, I was privileged and humbled because they would, they would come and see me about things that were on their minds and in their hearts. And it really is, you know, when somebody walks into your office and, and, and unloads all the stuff in their lives, it's, uh, it's such a privileged place to be. It's such a privileged place to be. To, to be trusted like that, mm -hmm. and have someone pour out their heart to you and, and ask, don't even ask you to solve their problems, just more or less to, to hear their problems, you know, and uh, to let them cry and uh, just to, to be with them sometimes. That's so, these are some of the hard times. Uh, I mean, it could be something imp internal or it could be the death of a parent or a grandparent. Um, just to have the experience of being there for them and have them take advantage of your time. Whew, it's, a, it's such a gift. It's such a holy place to be, a holy place to be. So I, I did that, and uh, but I, then I became director of campus ministry. I stayed living in that dorm. I still did my thing every night. <clears throat> um, but even before I became a director, there, uh, there weren't enough kids going to mass as far as I was concerned at St. Louis University, not enough. We had a big, big college church um, but we had a mass. The, the parish had two masses in the morning, maybe a third, uh, and and that was it for the parish. Uh, but it was also our our chapel. So we the chemist ministry had a, a mass at four thirty, which was attended by a lot of parishioners too, and a mass at seven p.m., which wasn't very popular. So I decided to start a mass at ten o'clock at night. This is 1989. I was told it couldn't happen. They wouldn't go. I said, yeah, they will. And uh, so I said, well, you're going to have to do it by yourself because no one's going to help you. I said, this part. So I started this mess at 10 o'clock and, uh, and I got volunteers. I mean, I remember the first one, Dr. Willing, Dr. Michael Willing. He's a wonderful man he's a, in Cincinnati, Ohio. I paid for his guitar lessons. And he was our first guitarist and vocalist, and he got a couple of his buddies to sing, and that's that's how our music started. And then when I became director, I had a lot of access to money, and we had a great budget. Uh, so I started paying five musicians and singers. And uh, within a year and a half, we started getting a thousand people every Sunday night at the 10 o'clock mass. And uh, we had a choir. I said to the guy I hired the choir director, I said, I want any kid who plays any instrument to be able to play. So we had, we told them, if you have play an instrument you want to play, you know, come, uh, come to the practice. So we had violins, we had cellos, we had drums, we had bongos, we had keyboards, we, we had 60 or 70 kids in the choir. It was uh, with all their various instruments. I paid five. Uh, and there's a tape of the music. It's, uh, they're still going. It's, uh, the, it's just wonderful. The 10 p.m. Mass Choir. It, uh, it took off like nobody's business. And, you know, one of the things about it was there'd be people wanted to, of course, all of a sudden the judges wanted to be able to say this Mass, you know. I said, fine, you can say it. I said, but uh, you have to concelebrate. So we would have eight or nine concelebrants every Sunday night at 10 o'clock, you know. 
And uh, if you can celebrate on a regular basis, then you got to preach at it. And uh, so we had great preachers. We had great, great celebrations. And we did when we did confirmations and baptisms right after Easter, we would do like the whole Easter vigil all over again. It was just wonderful. We'd love to have a bishop come in. Usually a good bishop, not always, uh, but uh, it was uh, it was such a privilege. And I got a retreat program really going. You know, it's uh, a lot ahead of steam. We used to send three buses to to Washington D.C. for the March for Life. Uh, we used to send a couple of buses down to Georgia for the uh, Ignatian teach-in. You know, and near the uh, the army base. Um, wow, it! Uh, I loved my time at St. Louis University. At that time. I started three different chemistry centers because they kept moving us. Uh, Michael, as you described what, what, uh, what you did, what you accomplished, what you experienced uh, at uh, St. Louis University, it's uh, almost a prelude to uh, what you accomplished here. You were eight years director of campus ministry? Six here. Six years. Yeah. Michael, when you came back, um, you had been away from Fairfield for a very long time. Yeah, so uh, what was your, when you came back, what year did you come back? I came back in 2006. When you came back in 2006, you talked about the, uh, your classmates and the Jesuits and faculty who, who uh, affected you and shaped you. What happened when you came back? Did you meet some of those same people? Were there new people? Uh, tell us about the Fairfield that you encountered when you came back before we invite you to say something about how you transposed what you learned about campus ministry and shaping a new campus ministry here. Well, you know, George Gallarelli, God bless George Gallarelli, was still here, still working full time, you know, so Larry O'Neill. Um, I mean, George, uh, George was, um, well, I can't remember what he was doing when I first came back. I think he was, he was, was he director of admissions or he was dean? Of admissions when I came back. He you know? was dean of admissions when women first came, right? For a long, yeah, 1970, yes. They said he liked short skirts. No, <laughs> but he, yeah, he was dean of admissions for a long time. And uh, then he became uh, chaplain to the athletes uh, after Larry O'Neill died. And um, Vinnie Burns was here, taught theology when I was a student here. Wonderful, funny. He was one of your models in learning how to be abandoned, right? Didn't Vinny have a, a car or two and a boat or two stashed away yes. somewhere on campus that superiors didn't know about? Right. It, yeah. well, he didn't. He didn't ask for permission for them, so he couldn't be said to be disobedient. So, so he, uh, so you ask forgiveness, not permission, as a Jesuit. You now, know. was Jim Fitz on the staff when you came back? Jim Fitz is uh, he played basketball here when I was a student, but Jim Fitz, Jim Fitzpatrick is my role model for what it is to be a layman who lives the exercises. Jim Fitzpatrick is one of the most remarkable Catholic Christian Ignatian men I have ever met in my life. I am so grateful to him, the impact he's had in my life uh, these last 15 years. He is so remarkable, so remarkable. And he is a role model for so many of our students and so many of the good things he does and he does so many good things for people. You never hear a whisper about it. He never, he never blows his own horn. You wouldn't know it. He is, uh, he is for me, Mr. Fairfield. He, uh, he welcomed me back in, uh, in wonderful ways and has helped me in every way I want, everything I could ask in, in ministry. Uh, he is I can't say enough good things about Jim, but now he's probably, if he's watching, he'll be all red and embarrassed. But, uh, but there are other people like Jim too, not, a, not as great as Jim, but uh, there are people who, uh, who really understand the exercises. They, they really do. Uh, and Joan Lee is one of them. I see her face there. Um, but, uh, you know, so many of the people here now have done the exercises. Like a little louder, please. So many people here now have done the exercises through your program, Jerry, uh, the 19th Annotation Retreat. And so, the, so the, the spirit of Ignatius still is here in this university. But there are standout characters who, uh, like, like Jim Fitzpatrick. And, um, and I, I think it was Colleen Gibson, you know, she was a student here. Uh, 
and she was very involved in campus ministry. And, um, and now this is the calling who's now a sister of St. Joseph of Chestnut Hill. Paul right. Lakeland brought her back in one of his, in his series quite yep. recently. recently. I, hope, I hope you've had a chance, you had a chance to, uh, to hear Colleen. I didn't, but I just, I can, I can hear it. I know I can listen to it, but I spoke to her last year. She was here for an event last year at one of the dances and uh, we didn't dance together, but we had a long conversation. Uh, she's uh, yeah, she's a remarkable woman. Um, but there's so many people like that. I think of the, when I started the, the liturgy here at Fairfield, the, uh, uh, the 9 p.m. mass, I really got going. When I came here, it was, there was one guy who played the piano and sang. I didn't think that was quite adequate. So I started with the help of a lot of students, the Lord's Chords. I bet you, there's some Lord's Chords alumni and alumnae. Oh, there uh, Maybe, uh, I'm sure some of them are probably. My Alex Paris, perhaps, I mean, who was one of them. There were so many of them that were so, so good that uh, the music at the 9 p.m. mass was excellent from the time they started going with two guitarists uh, to, to up to recently, well, even now, I mean, it's right hard during the COVID, but uh, their music has been great because they've thrown their hearts into it. They really have thrown their hearts into it. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm very proud of what they did, what they've done, what they do. And I hope when COVID's over that that energy comes back to liturgical music at, at Fairfield because it's, uh, it's great. We used to even have a, a retreat for the Lord's Chords that they went on when uh, Caroline Maxwell, God bless Caroline Maxwell. She's when I arrived, I because I, I don't arrive quietly anywhere, Jerry, as you know. So guess, yeah. So I decided we were going to do something with that liturgy, come hell or high water, and uh, she was in charge of the liturgical music at the time, and so I told her what I wanted, what I anticipated, what I expected, and she was. <gasps> yeah. But together. We did it. You did it. Seven. And then, Michael, after six, after eight years, you transitioned into uh, a position which you have described to me as the most gratifying and the most meaningful ministry you've had. Could you move your head a tiny bit, Michael? Because I want people to see what's behind you. Oh, there. It's, Re it's Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son returning to the prodigal father. And so um, would you share something, Michael, about this last period, uh, this most recent period of your ministry here, which as I say, you yourself characterize as the one that's meant most to you. Yeah, it's been, it's the ministry that I didn't have to run anything in a way, you know, hire, fire, salaries, uh, uh, yeah, it's the, been the most joyful ministry I've had. It, uh, so sustaining. And I got started with Jeff von Arx, who... Uh, What's the title of your ministry again, Michael? Many, almost everybody's familiar, but say it again. I'm the director of restorative mentoring. Restorative mentoring. Right. So I try to restore students to our community and to their families, you know? Because when they're in, touch, in trouble with us, they're in, in trouble also with, the, with their families frequently enough, you know? And and kids mess up, you know, so it's, uh, and I, this, this picture behind me means so much to me because that's, that's how I picture my life all the time, you know, I'm always going back for forgiveness and knowing that God comes out to me first, you know. Don't you have a mug that says something like that? Yes, where you is You have it? your mug with you? Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> Where's your mug? I'll show you. I mean, we see your mug on there, you know, we see your ugly mug now, but I mean, you also have bad joke what there's, there's the mug jerry can you see it okay fairfield university a feisty stag totally forgiven <laughs> so not partially not conditionally no no totally forgiven that's, that's what, what, about, what about eggs oh yes so oh, i have some memory or somebody somebody talks about you and what's the egg well you know when i give a retreat the with with Todd Palaza and my friend Hannah, uh, I was I was trying to you get Todd to, Palaza to come and help you too, huh? Every every crossroads retreat, he helps me. Everyone he helps me with. He gives a great talk. He's wonderful with the students. They love him. And Hannah Donovan a comes. Shout out to Todd Palaza. Palaza. A shout out to Jim Fitz. A shout out to Todd Palaza. 
I saw Carolyn Rosakis as well here too. A shout out to Carolyn. They're Carolyn wonderful Rosakis. people. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Michael, so the egg, what the hell is the egg about? The egg is, um, I wanted to have something to give them besides, besides the cup. Uh, so I, eggs are a great religious symbol, you know, and they, they're the, they contain the fullness of life. You know, an egg does, con, uh, it's, everyone is different. Everyone has little flaws and different shapes and slightly different shade of color, but they all contain within them every necessary for life. And that's what every one of our students has. I tell them, you have all that's necessary for a good life, to give new life, to bring new life. Uh, it's God gives it to us. We're all unique. We're all different. We're all wonderful. Uh, and so take care of that. You know, it's uh, Michael, what are the kind of people who end up in your, we, uh, who are the students? What do they bring with them when they, when they're, uh, uh, it's not, you again, it's not just your charm that leads them into your office. Usually they've been uh, encouraged to, uh, to go to see you and to participate in your programs, right? Well, the uh, ones who go on the Crossroads Retreat are, uh, are assigned. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they, they have to, most of the students who see me are assigned to, to see me for restorative mentoring or for the retreat. But and lots of my- restorative, Let me go back to that. What does restorative mentoring involve? What, what are you looking to have to facilitate there, Michael? Well, you know, kids get in trouble for various things, you know, some serious, some not so serious. Uh, so basically, I mean, my, my program, they don't know it, is, uh, is based on this. Of the examine. The examine. I mean, I don't call it that for them. I stretch it out just to help them to look at what are you thankful for? Why are you here? You know, and so I have them look at their lives, do an examination, look at their lives. And, and uh, I tell them, you know, it's very firmly, it depends on the student, but if they have, if they're in, if they're in serious trouble, it means their gra grades usually suck as well, you know. So, uh, so I'll have them come in. And I'll say, so tell me. I said, uh, so ask them where they're from and background, so forth and so on. I say, how do you see? I have a two point four, you know. And uh, I ask them if they know what it costs to go to Fairfield for a year. Uh, and then sometimes they don't know. I said, well, I tell them. I said, so uh, you have uh, scholarship money? And so I said, so that so somebody is paying you, giving you money to come to school here. I said, oh, some of that comes from the Jesuit scholarship fund that the Jesuit worked so hard for for so many years, and others comes from alumni. I said, and your parents spend the the rest of the balance. Yeah. I said, tell me, where's your uh, where's your ski home for the winter time? And uh, I've got one of those. And, well, where's your, do you have a place on the Cape? No. What do you do for the summers? Well, we don't have a house. And I said, uh, you know why? <laughs> it's because your parents are putting $50,000 a year into your education. They're giving you Mercedes Benz value. You're giving them back a jalopy. I said, so how do you look yourself in the face in the mirror in the morning? How do you look in the mirror in front of your face? So um, I get them a little bit jumpy. And then I said, so, so how can we change this? So then I give them you know, some, uh, I teach them how to manage their time. And they have to come see me every week. And I make them do a calendar on, on, online, you know. And uh, I said, so I want you to put in, you know, all your class hours. And then I want you to put 25 hours more in on top of that. Your parents work 40 hours a week, yeah. I said, well, I want you to work 40 hours a week. And I want you to account for it every week. Where's your, where's your time? Where's your time going? And, uh, and I say, if you put the 40 hours in, you'll, get, you'll be on the dean's list. And they do. So, but I bring them through the whole examine, you know, Thanksgiving, illumination, examination, examination was first, and then contrition. Are they sorry? And, then, and uh, I say, have you told your parents how sorry you are for what you did, for what you've cost them, for this expensive ambulance ride, you know, on a Friday night because you decided that uh, Tito's, you were going to beat Tito's and Tito's beat you. Uh, <laughs> I said, then now there's a future. So let's go to the future. Let's put all this crap behind us. And now let's focus on the future. Where, where are you going to go? Uh, and I said, it wouldn't hurt you to drop in the chapel from time to time. You know, thank God for, for what he's done for you. I don't admit that you go to mass, but you know, God is in your life. And you're here at a Jesuit university, Catholic university, and you might want to develop a relationship with God while you're here. Because it, it'll, it'll be there for you when times get tough. So, uh, so that's basically how I deal with them. And, you know, I also go to lots of athletic events, you know, and uh, even when I was an uh, undergraduate, I remember uh, 
we went to all the basketball games. I remember Art Kenny, the six foot eight center when I was here, he was a giant. Peter Gillen, who was a coach someplace after in the Middle West. Uh, <laughs> there was a kid named Boyd I liked. Uh, Jim Fitz was on the basketball team. He hasn't let go since. You know, so uh, so I went. To, I go to a lot of sporting events. You are a pretty. You have been a pretty loyal supporter of, of soccer. But I think if I don't, if I get this right, you're particularly uh, loyal to the lads and uh, and lasses and the rugby. Uh, My rugby teams. thugs. Absolutely right. I love the rugby kids. And uh, you know, when I was here, they had a gravel thing to play on. It was terrible, terrible field. Now they have Groward Field, thanks to the Groward family. But uh, they're wonderful young men. I got involved with them about 12 years ago because they got in trouble. Um, but I've, uh, I've kept them on the straight and narrow. They're on, on a short leash. I mean, I'm not too short a leash. But uh, I love the rugby guys. And, and you know what? They have to have a higher GPA than every other uh, club because we, we did their constitution. And they perform. You know, if, they, if you ask students to perform, they will. And uh, all they need is some attention, you know. Michael, we only have a few minutes now. Uh, so I wonder whether I can come back to the question that I initially presented to you when we reached this uh, juncture in your Jesuit life. I want to give a shout out to two other people first. Please. Bob Burcham, who is such a role model also in the exercises, such a great alumnus, and, uh, and uh, Mary and Brian LeClaire, who are such, have become good friends through basketball, who are so generous with our, our basketball players. They are, they, so I just want to call out to them. I don't know if they're here or not, but they did great things. And I see Carolyn Zyka's name here. No one in the world has tra trained better ministers or lecturers than Carolyn Zykas. She is dynamite. And sorry, Jerry, go ahead. No, no, I'm just going to say, um, Michael, say again why it is that you characterize this ministry as very much um, the apex or, or the fullness uh, of where God has brought you to. Well, it's because I see <clears throat> all my, uh, I have a good prayer life. And it's, it's because I, God allows me to be available to the students that I serve and the, and the people that I serve. And God is, has used me in his hands for this kind of service. And it's very humbling and, and gratifying. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, gratitude is what I'm, I'm at about right now. It's, uh, I'm, I'm about service as much as I can be, given my age. But, um, but it's... Uh, I, I take such pleasure, Jerry, when uh, graduation comes around and I stand up behind the, this VIP tent and I watch the students I've walked by and the students I've, see, I've talked to who've had to see me and they, they call out to me. It, it's such, it can be such pleasure because I say, well, here's a kid who's gone on. He overcame that difficulty and he's accepted himself again. It's just, I think of my ministry as healing. And I think always of myself as being healed. You know. I can't I can't think of a better note on which to end our time with Michael Duty. Um, I hope that your visit with him this evening has brought back many warm memories of your own experiences with him and with other mentors, faculty members uh, here uh, on our campus. This is what Fairfield is about. And I thank you all. Uh, for being such important members of our Fairfield family and helping Fairfield to continue to live its mission through who we, through the example that you give. Thank you very much. And Michael, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, thank Jerry. You. Thanks, everybody. Thank you both so much. And thank you all for being here. We hope you have a great night. And Father Duty, happy early birthday. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so the, the, the checks, the money orders, the credit card gifts, they can all come in so that I can afford to take him out for dinner on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Don't